distinguished scholars, excellencies, former diplomats, friends from the diplomatic community, experts, friends from the media, and dear participants, good morning. Namaste and a warm welcome to International Conference on Understanding Nepal's Foreign Policy. I am Sila Parajuli, researcher at Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. This today's conference is held today and tomorrow, and we will be hosting around 140 scholars, experts, and diplomats through 27 sessions. I once again invite you to this inaugural session of the conference. To begin with, I would like to invite Research Director Nice, Dr. Pramod Jeshwal, to deliver the welcome speech. Dr. Pramod Jeshwal is a Research Director at Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. He has been a regular and visiting faculty at different universities of Nepal and China. He is visiting fellow at Sandia National Laboratories Cooperating Monitoring Center Albuquerque, New Mexico, US, and senior fellow at the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies, New Delhi. Previously, he has worked with Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi, and as a Delhi correspondent with the Rising Nepal. He is the member of Editorial Board, Journal of International Affairs, Kathmandu, member of the Academic Committee at the Pengal Institute, Beijing, member of International Advisory Community, Journal of Liberty and International Affairs, Macedonia, and Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Security and International Studies, and member of Subject Committee of International Relations and Diplomacy, through one University. Dr. Jaiswal, over to you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Professor Dr. Mina Baidemala, Professor Dr. Samburam Simkhada, Professor Dr. Khadr Kesi, uh, Ambassador Dr. Madan Bhatrai, uh, Mr. Deepak Tal Joshi, distinguished scholars, experts, excellencies, former diplomats, friends from the diplomatic community, friends from the media, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, namaste and good morning. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all at the NICE International Conference on Understanding Nepal's Foreign Policy. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, a political and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. NICE has hosted several eminent leaders, policymakers, and public intellectuals such as Professor Norm Chomsky, Professor Mir Shaima, Professor Stephen Wald, Professor Barry Buzan, Professor John Ickenberry, uh, former Deputy PM and Foreign Minister of New Zealand, Sir Donald Charles Mackinnon, State Minister of Education of Maldives, Dr. Abdullah Rasid Ahmed, Ministers of Nepal, State Minister of Regional Cooperation Sri Lanka, Mr. Tharaka Bala Surya, Professor Kishore Mahubwani, Foreign Secretary of Sri Lanka, Dr. Jainath Kolambage, Vice Admiral of Japan, Yoji Koda, uh, former Foreign Secretaries of India, Chief of Defense Staff of Indian Armed Forces, General Bipin Raut, directors of several reputed think tanks and professors from world's best universities. In the last two years, we have published around 450 articles, hosted around 1,500 scholars through 120 events. We have hosted several international conferences, such as NICE Global Conclave, where we had 220 scholars from 47 countries, International Women's Summit, Young Scholars Summit, International Conference on Understanding China, International Conference on International Migration, International Studies Convention, and several others. NICE also publishes a journal called Journal of Security and International Studies. Determined to break away from the geostrategic isolation and appeasement policy, Nepal opened itself to the world after the end of autocratic Rana regime in 1951. The country which had limited external relations till 1951 has expanded its diplomatic relation to about 171 countries since then. Nepal joined the United Nations in December 1955 and one, was one of the founding members of SARC in 1985. Nepal is also a member of several regional and multilateral forums, such as Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the Asia Cooperation Dialogue, among others. With the aim to enhance the dignity of the nation by safeguarding its sovereignty, 
territorial integrity and independence and the promote economic well-being and prosperity of citizens. Nepalese foreign policy is guided by pancil peaceful coexistence. In the last two decades, Nepal has struggled through a difficult transition from war to peace, from autocratic to democracy, from an exclusionary to an centralized state to a more inclusive feudal form of governance, and from an outright Hindu state to a secular one in character. Nepal has engrossed in domestic turmoil for more than 15 years, but with the promulgation of the new constitution in 2015, the country aims to achieve political stability. Today, Nepal aims to diversify its foreign relations by engaging beyond India and China and development partners like the US, UK, and Japan. The recent high-level visits to Vietnam, Cambodia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar clearly indicate Nepal's attempt to foster its ties with the external neighborhood with a focus on economic diplomacy. Also, the escalation in Sino-India rivalry and the emergence of Quad and AUK-US establishes the fact that Nepal can no longer afford to remain a buffer state or a vibrant breeze with a longer role to play. It is in this context we aim to have this two-day international conference on understanding Nepal's foreign policy. The aim of the two-day conference is to have a comprehensive discourse and conversation on Nepal's foreign policy with the purpose of discussing its policy priorities and choices, identify the current complexities and gaps, and establishing new discourses. We have around 140 scholars, diplomats, policymakers, senior journalists, and experts who will be sharing their exper expertise through 27 different sessions. This nice international conference on understanding Nepal's foreign policy and academic discussion, the chairs, moderators, and panelists will speak in open format without any protocol precedence. All the sessions will be recorded, transcribed, published, and used for academic purpose. I, on behalf of NICE, would like to thank all our distinguished scholars and participants for joining us today. We are really honored by your kind presence. The convention is streaming live on our Facebook pages, Twitter, and several other Facebook pages of Nepali media simultaneously. We have shared the link with the, we have shared the link in the chat box. So kindly share it on social media so that Maximum can benefit from this discussion. We'd also like to request everyone to tweet about this event. I once again welcome all our distinguished speakers and audience to the International Conference on Understanding Nepal's Foreign Policy. Thank you. Over to you, Sheila. Thank you, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, for the welcome remarks. Our next speaker, Mr. Narayan Kajisrasta, is unable to join us due to some urgent tasks. Therefore, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Professor Dr. Meena Baidyamalla. Professor Dr. Meena Baidyamalla, an academician, is a professor of political science. She was the former head of Central Department of Political Science through one university. She has written a number of research articles on contemporary issues of politics and governance. She is decorated with Dirga Seva Padak, Mahendra Vidya Bhusanka by the then King, and the Supraval Jana Seva Sri by the President of Nepal. She has been associated as an expert and a guest faculty member in Army Command and Staff College on advanced course on national security since its start. She is now a member of Academic Subcommittee, Infrastructure Development Committee, National Defense University, Nepal, Ministry of Defense, Government of Nepal. Professor Malla, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Daisawal, NIIC, and the entire team. Let me first of all congratulate for organizing such a comprehensive international conference on Nepal's foreign policy. Uh, distinguished speakers, experts, and uh, all the participants from various and uh, related areas. A very good morning to all of you. It's my honor to have been asked to speak on Nepal's foreign policy, the constraints and the preparations in this event in the inaugural session. We know Nepal is always an independent and ancient country in South Asia. This is the historical reality. She has that experience of promoting international peace and security based on always mutual benefit and a mutual understanding. This is how she has been a trustworthy partner in her dealings between and among the community of nations since long. So understanding Nepal's foreign policy so far, I think, can be understood 
in three different perspectives. They are continuity, chains, and the challenges. Number one, continuity with basic foreign policy principles that she always go, goes ahead with. And the two is change with adjustment with the changing global power structures. And the third is the challenge that she has to overcome for the opportunities they are lying ahead. Now, the continuity factor in Nepal's foreign policy is its adherence in letter and the spirit to the principle of Pancasil, that is mutual respect for each other's sovereignty, the territorial integrity, non-interference, non-aggression, equality, and the peaceful coexistence. Nepal's foreign policy is always understood from legalistic and the moralistic lenses towards international affairs and always supporting international law in good faith. That is the principle of live and let live. Always her attempt to, to develop an independent opinion on the issue of world peace and the security that makes her external relations more accountable, visible, and always just and impartial. That is what we always continue to have amity with all and enmity with none. Foreign policy, as we know, is always dynamic, so has to change with the changing realities. Now, in that course, Nepal's foreign policy is, the under, is on the process to reassess and restructure and reset with the, globing, with the global changing realities. So, this is the main juncture and point so far, I think, where we see some important changes and the transformations in Nepal's foreign policy. Number one is its emphasis on soft power diplomacy, that is soft power culture in diplomatic projection, the multidimensional connectivities, her views on revision of treaties, mostly the bilateral, and solving the outstanding, long-standing border disputes they are the prime area of concern. In the same way, her fate to work collectively for combating terrorism, the rising non-state actors, cyber crimes, and human securities, they also come on their priority delays. In the same way, she is well convinced to work in collaboration in controlling pandemic and disasters, whatever may be the man-made or the natural. Now she is enhancing multi-track approach to diplomacy. So public diplomacy, economic and the labor diplomacy, they are much talked about, which once were quite ignored and unexplored. So in the same way, Nepal's focus on climate crisis brought about by climate deteriorations and the changes and her concern for ecological balance and the conservation of planet definitely all definitely add major agendas of Nepal foreign policy now. At the same time, we see pressure arising from globalizations, democratizations, and the liberalizations. And also we see the growing public sentiment of 21st century for human rights, rule of law, right to self-determination. They are also the added priority areas of Nepal's foreign policy. All these changes have brought a paradigm shift from the conventional mode of relations and the diplomacy to a more public-based one. In the same way we have remarked, we have observed public awareness on foreign policy issues in Nepal. They have increased over the years. This is quite a positive indication because this makes foreign policy not only res representative, responsible, and a uh, uh, responsive, but also it directs foreign policy to be more dynamic, to be more vibrant, and of course, human. Another remarkable change and the transformation in foreign policy is coming from the geopolitics and the geostrategic location of Nepal. This is our geographical reality, and this is the geographical fact. Nepal's strategic location has played a vital role in determining the means and the methods of Nepal's external relations with her neighbors and other big powers as well. 
We see now India and China both are emerging as significant powers in the region with already nuclear power and a supersonic nuclear system. They are now at the power competitions. They are the power rivalries in the region. So this activity has now enhanced geopolitical importance of Nepal more than ever. And this made Nepal a vibrant bridge between the two Asian giants, also boosted this activity strategically up for connecting and the transfer, transformed Nepal from landlocked to a landlit status. Now, over the past three decades, much has happened at home and abroad in Nepal. During the period, Nepali leaders, they are concentrated largely on nation building process. They dealt, they, they struggled for democracy. They managed decade long insurgency, dealt with peace process, dealt with state transformations and the restructuring of state and making constitutions through constitutional assemblies. All these made Nepal's foreign policy go through a period of sheer neglect that the country should have dealt in top priority. So in the same way, externally, we have seen the unprecedented changes around in power structure and balance. First of all, the rise of multipolar world, the rise of new actors and the declining and the deterioration of other powers once they were significant and the superpower in the world. In the same way, the regionalism is being emerged and one as one of the major agendas of global politics. That's why we see power shift from West to East and South Asia now is emerging as the epicenter of new Asian 21st century. We see the power contestations in the region and the formation of alliance. It has been a, play, a playground for major power rivalries. So one of the examples we see now, the rise of China, it has forced the United States, Australia, Japan, and India to come together to court the quadrilateral security dialogue, a new alliance in Asia Pacific region for the containment of China. The US interest has grown over the years with Indo-Pacific view. On the other side, China is making inroads to South Asia in the direction of expansion and her aspiration for being a global trade leader. She has developed economic political interest across the region with BRI. And in the same way, European Union is not less interested in the region. So we see the power, we see power, superpowers, they are entering either with Indo-Pacific policy or BRI. Anyway, what we have to understand now is the reason is already at the start of major power contestation. So the question is how Nepal needs to meticulously escape such alliances and the strategies is a matter of serious concern. For that, she should prevent the major power influence ensuring that her vital interests are met. The ter our territories are not being used to harm others. This is where Nepal's adherence to non-aligned foreign policy principle unveils. This is how we continue to seek benefits from what the friendly nations have to offer because we do believe in shared benefits. These major developments both at home and abroad, it warrants reorienting Nepal's foreign policy. So against this back, backdrop, uh, recently, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has unveiled Nepal's foreign policy document 2020 in the light of changes in regional and the global power structures. That new foreign policy directs Nepal to play more effective and a very productive role in promoting the rights of the landlocked and the LDCs in various multilateral and international organizations. And also stresses on transit right to international trade as mentioned in international law and the practices. In the same way, it plays, it is to play active role in the group of 77 for LDGs common benefit and the problems. The most important thing is Nepal's greater part is to play an effective role for the achievement of the objectives of the regional and the sub-regional 
organizations of which Nepal is already a part, like SARC, WIMSTEC, BBIN, and like uh, Asian corporations dialogue. Now, coming to the major challenges and the threats, how Nepal comes up is a very important concern. For that, she has to adjust with the rapidly shifting international environment and the global paradigm shift. So it is necessary to realize that the world today is quite different from what it used to be. We have to prepare ourselves to deal with the enormity of changes without compromising our independence and the integrity at any cost. In such context, Nepal's foreign policy, if Cassie lies in clear preparation of its diplomatic roles in it by using skills and the abilities of relational management. Nepal's low regime capability, as we have seen, it is arising from ideological differences in national agendas and uh, our intense power struggle that we have seen at home, they all explain its relational deficit in her external relations. So the biggest text of political leadership and the diplomacy is to manage the domestic mess and the international relation in such a way that best serve our national interest and identity, national prosperity and the national development. We know the theories of foreign policy always assert that foreign policy is influenced by domestic considerations to a greater extent. Foreign policy is always the extension and the reflection of national policy. So it should not be understood as a policy of a particular party that runs the government of the day one. It is the policy of the whole nation, so the policy of the sovereign people. So Nepal needs to put its house in order with a strong national consensus and overcome the problems of over-politicization from any of the outside uh, partners. Also necessary that the top leaders will not interpret and twist international relations, international cooperation, the diplomatic practices and the protocols in their favor at the cost of national interest and the security. So finally, what she needs to do further is to find a right policy for his special strategy first. The second is increase leverage in bargaining, dialogue, discourse, and negotiation, and stay out of the power competitions without being influenced by any of the external powers. Going ahead with these ideas, ideals, and the principles in her external relation, definitely turn all the constraints into opportunities in the days ahead. So my understanding is for an independent foreign policy that can be fostered and institutionalized if state capability is fully consolidated and the leadership knows where the national interest lies and what strategies enrich national security. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Malla. And Mr. Dr. Dinesh Vatra is unable to join us due to some urgent tasks. Therefore, we would like to proceed with the next guest. I am happy to introduce and Mr. Dr. Sambhuram Simkhara to this inaugural session. Dr. Sambhuram Simkhara served as a member of Secretariat of the Special Committee chaired by the Prime Minister and its Technical Committee for the Supervision, Integration and Rehabilitation of the Maoist Army Combatants. He was a former permanent representative to the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, and other international organizations in Geneva, and also served as a chairman of United Nations Human Rights Commission Council, ambassador to Switzerland, and the member secretary and treasurer of Social Welfare Council. Dr. Sinkada, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh... Let me begin by um, really appreciating the outstanding skills of uh, uh, Dr. Jaiswal in bringing together such a distinguished panel of national and global scholarship, leadership, and diplomacy in his webinars. 
and thank him for uh, making me a part of this uh, very uh, interesting discourse. Mr. Chairman, you have placed me in between, uh, of course, two of them were not there, but an academic uh, and uh, a career diplomat supposed, supposed to be here before me. And of course, an equally distinguished panel of scholars and diplomats speaking after me. As a student, as a teacher, and as a practitioner, let me begin with a, a textbook argument that states formulate their foreign policies based on their understanding of international relations, which in turn is nothing but the study of relations among great powers and how that affects others. Now, foreign policy in turn is defined as the application of national power for the protection and promotion of a nation's national interest. Dr. Mina Baide's uh, statement that foreign policy oftentimes is also the extension of domestic politics. So in Trying to discuss the topic, understanding Nepal's foreign policy, relations of Nepal with the major powers, especially active in Nepal, India, China, United States. The relations among these powers and our own internal political transition taking place in an environment of equally profound changes taking place in our immediate neighborhood in the trans himalayas in the Indo-Pacific, and of course the whole world itself going through those profound changes. Now, how we understand these relationships, and of course, how Nepal is able to exercise its national power for the protection and protection, promotion of its own interest. Our perception and our understanding on this will fundamentally affect how we understand Nepal's foreign policy. Talking about these various aspects, recently the United Nations General Assembly identified several things but mainly three issues, COVID, climate, and Afghanistan, as the three principal events affecting the world collectively. And if there is one common theme of all these three together, that is the questioning of the traditional notions of power. How do we understand what power is? How nations apply their national powers and what contains national interest? So these demand a fundamental rethinking in how we define these the terminology. So to really understand Nepal's foreign policy, one has to understand how the dynamics of time and technology has affected Nepal's power in relation to not just the two neighbors, but also other countries, most significantly the omnipresent contemporary 
world's only superpower, the United States. And of course, the evolving relationships among these three most active in the world. One more conceptual def uh, clarification before I talk briefly on the two issues that Dr. Jaiswal has asked me to refer to, BRI and CHIPS. Despite textbook definitions of national interests, in reality, based on their worldviews, political predispositions, sociocultural affinities, and political economic priorities, Ultimately, it is the ruling elite who decide what is in the best national interest. Making the domestic politics foreign policy interface complex, but extremely significant. Which had a bigger role, it can be debated. But in my own understanding of Nepal's the balance sheet of modern Nepal's foreign policy, domestic politics, foreign policy interface has not been so rosy as some would like to delude themselves with. In fact, this has been, in my view, suicidal. And let me, uh, especially in particular reference to somewhere in the organization of the uh, seminar, I saw somewhere a relationship between foreign policy and democracy. That is what makes understanding the evolving global ideological polarization. And of course, the emergence of the Indo-Pacific and the trans Himalayas as the new global political economic and strategic epicenter and its impact on Nepal's ongoing political transition and subsequently its impact on our foreign policy. Now to illustrate the point, except for the early era of internal unification and external isolation and the Rana period, in which they followed a selective isolation for their own regime survival for over 100 years, as well as for protecting Nepal's national interests for 100 years. Nepal's first elected prime minister, B.P. Koirala, was the first to embark on a proactive foreign policy. Addressing the UN General Assembly, establishment of diplomatic relations with Israel, and of course, treaty of peace and friendship with China were examples. Now, what was the domestic political fallout of this proactive foreign policy? All of us know the democratic exercise was deposed and Koirala spent the rest of his life struggling to restore democracy. The most important foreign policy initiative of the monarchy, which presided over the system established by ending democracy, the zone of peace proposal, became a failure despite support by over 116 countries. Subsequently, the long ruling dynasty was first forced to leave power and ultimately the throne under domestic and international press. So despite much glorification, the defense diplomacy could neither prevent Nepalese suffering from a devastating insurgency nor protect its most important traditional institution. Now there is a lot of acclaim for the policy of non-alignment. 
And of course, Nepal has historically played an active role since its beginning. But is there any question that in fact there is alignment within non-alignment? And in fact, the real value of non-alignment at times of crisis have always been questionable. More recently, leaders presiding over profound internal changes struggle to institutionalize their achievements. A nationally driven peace process with one of the most unique models of rebels fighter management remains shunned in almost all international peace building, academic and policy literature, let alone application. Nepal has lost its bids for top positions in the UN General Assembly Presidency and UN Security Council seat. Despite successive governments making it one of the foreign policy priorities, not a single refugee entering Nepal has a return to their countries since the last 30 years. And it is reported that in fact, now Rohingyas and Afghan refugees have also entered Nepal reportedly without the government's, uh, government's notice. Although in great demand, Nepali workers continue to be the lowest paid and least protected in major labor markets. With Kathmandu as its headquarter and Nepal as its chair, where is SAR today? And what has been our role? Now on relations with the three major powers active in Nepal, the Mahakali Treaty signed with India since 1996 is languishing till today. Gradually normalizing relations adversely affected by, by the blockade after the promulgation of the 2015 constitution is now seriously complicated by the border dispute. Report submitted by the eminent persons group created by both sides to respond to Nepal's long demand for a review of the 1950 Treaty of Peace and Friendship is in deep freezer. Repeated requests for discussion on the border issue continue to be ignored. Despite historically deep rooted and wide ranging bonds of history, geography, politics, economics, religion and culture, and often invoked roti beti people to people relations. The perplexing question, why don't they like us? In Ambassador Ranjit Ray's much talked about book, The Kathmandu Dilemma, reflect the current state of Nepal in their relations and the need to redress it. Prime Minister K.P. Sarma Wali signed the much publicized transit treaty during his visit to China in 2016, followed by Nepal signing on to the Belt and Road Initiative as one of the original signatories. But progress on BRI projects proves trans-Himalayan connectivity easier conceptualized than materialized. Controversy over the 500 million US dollar Millennium Challenge Compact signed so many years ago, but pending ratification and most recent statements saying the US leaves the 70 years friendship partnership with Nepal on Nepal's port.
watching this chain of events in terms of internal transition and of course their relationship, their interrelationship between domestic politics and foreign policy, between our politics and geopolitics. In the immediate neighborhood and the world, recently it prompted me to tweet and I'm quoting, in the global grand scheme of things developing in the Indo-Pacific, to survive and thrive as a historically independent state. In the trans Himalayan epicenter, Nepal needs strategic thinkers and leaders, not just politicians and diplomats, skillful in securing lucrative positions for themselves. As a sad commentary on contemporary scholarship and leadership globally, one of my most favorite historians Yuval Noah Harari writes, and I'm quoting, today our knowledge is increasing at breakneck speed and theoretically we should understand the world better and better. But the very opposite is happening. Our newfound knowledge leads to faster economic, social and political change, but we are less and less able to make sense of the present or foresee the future, end of quote. Sadly or happily, fortune tellers foretell which ruling family will rule for how many generations and who will become what for how many times in the new political dispensation in Nepal. Celestial or earthly. Obviously, fortune tellers with power to turn myths real may already have Nepal's history and geography mapped out. How are Nepalese going to be affected in such future scheme of things? Reflection on changes taking place internally, but also in our immediate neighborhood. and beyond and appropriate responses to prevent Nepal traveling the same path as Cambodia, Rwanda, or Yugoslavia yesterday, or Somalia, Iraq, and Afghanistan today, profoundly challenges Nepal's scholarship, leadership, and diplomacy. Based on these lessons of history, and of course the main challenge of diplomats, prevention, if possible, and resolution when necessary. My recent book, Triumph and Trauma of Transition, Nepal, India, China, Relations in the 21st Century, and Human Rights, Human Wrongs in the Scale of Human Functions, revolved around these goals from different aspects. Let me conclude by saying that after the promulgation of the constitution by the representatives of the people, Nepal created a new history. Now the challenge of everyone, politician, leaders, and diplomats is to transform, institutionalize this historic change by institutionalizing the democratic dispensation, this tremendous transformation, and subsequently enhance Nepal's image in the international community and truly protect our vital national interest and national dignity. I believe a discourse of this kind, bringing together such a distinguished group of people mostly from Nepal, but also from around the world, bringing our friends and well-wishers, I think is one of the most important steps in institutionalizing this process of transformation that we are undergoing. I would like to con con uh, con conclude by once again thanking Dr. Gaswal 
and saying my namaskar to all participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Simkhada. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce yet another guest, Professor Dr. Kharga Kesi. Professor Kharga Kesi is a Japan Foundation Fellow, Monbusu Fellow of Government of Japan, U.S. State Department SUSI Fellow, and a guest professor at Leishan Normal University, China, and a visiting faculty at Nepal Army Command and Staff College. APF Command and Staff College and Nepali Army Higher Command and Management. He holds his PhD and postdoctoral research from Nagasaki University, Japan under Japanese government scholarship. He has edited Journal of Political Science and Journal of International Affairs. He is on the editorial board of Journal of International Affairs, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, Journal of Asian Political Affairs, Department of Political Science, Chittagong University, Bangladesh, and Policy Review Journal, Policy Research Institute, Nepal. He has contributed numerous research articles in national and international journals. Dr. Casey is speaking on evolution of international studies in Nepal. Over to you, Dr. Casey. Thank you, Srila. Uh, good morning, Namaskar, everyone. Some of them are from China or Nihau, and maybe some Japan, Ohio, Gozaimas. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Jaisawal, for making such a really extraordinary uh, initiative for a long while. Uh, I think uh, I have to really much like uh, acknowledge and grateful to Dr. Jaisawal. He has, uh, he has been always like uh, keeping me in his uh, loop for such a, a great academic uh, initiative. Thank you very much once again for inviting me this morning. and. Uh, Professor Mo Lonisar, our respected academic and foreign diplomat, and uh, former foreign secretary, career uh, ambassador, uh, very like close uh, uh, guru of mine as well in my initiative, Madam Batai sir, and Professor Mina Bedemala, my seniors, uh, respected professor of the university, Ambassador Sambu Sinkara, and Brigadier Rawal, I have seen uh, from the Foreign Secretary, uh, Foreign uh, Chief Secretary, and Ambassador Nila Maripore also somewhere in, I have seen here, and many other scholars and colleagues, and my some of them are my students as well, former students and incumbent students. I'm so much happy, however, being a humble academic, uh, I don't have to have any, many things to say about how to make policy uh, and, and great things about foreign policy because I have never experienced being a diplomat and policy maker. I'm just very uh, humble academic uh, who can uh, who has been assigned uh, by uh, Dr. Jaisawal uh, the evolution of IR studies in Nepal. Uh, probably how can like IR study can be connected to contribute for foreign policy of Nepal country like Nepal a small power uh, like aspiring to graduate from the L L LDC. So what, what like, you know, academia, intellectual history, uh, quality human resource can be uh, very much like, you know, uh, crucial for country like ours, somehow that can be my contribution in my uh, series. Well, um, Nepal, uh, many of my predecessors, uh, seniors, scholars and diplomats uh, has already shared about Nepal's foreign policy framing. And uh, I have study in, uh, in the Western world, I have study is a mostly American contribution after Second World War, post-World War, 1919. Almost 100 plus years ago, IR is a separate discipline established in American University and British University. And even today, it uh, seems like that I have studied a more Western American, American kind of like uh, academic discourse. For us, we have the the most youngest uh, South Asian like uh, university, uh, which uh, has started IR in 2014 only. Though uh, Nepal, uh, our intell modern intellectual history of Nepal is quite behind because we established university only in 1959. So we are just passing the 60 years of university education, modern university education so that intellectual history uh, means matters a lot uh, for uh, like, you know, 
um, research and development, knowledge production, in every domains of life or state, uh, state life. So because of uh, late commerce, uh, probably not colonized, uh, and we don't have colonial legacy uh, compared to the, all the South Asian country. And for example, Dhaka University was established in 100 plus years ago. And many other universities in India also because of colonial empires, they established the university. So that we are the late comer and Dhaka University uh, recently uh, celebrated the 70 years uh, anniversary of IR department. Whereas we are in the seventh years in, in this university, though IR was uh, used to teach it uh, under the political science, uh, a paper in political science since after the establishment of TU in 1959 onward. And the major contribution of IR study in Nepal was made by those golden days of SENAS, Center for Nepal and Asian Study in 70s and 80s. I think in my, uh, my perception, in my observation, uh, SENAS did a uh, significant contribution in security study, foreign policy, uh, like uh, area study, country study, that was made possible by those academic leaders like Prayaga, Sharma, Durbadur, Bista, and specifically Kumar Khardabikram Saz. And those were the leaders of that institution. And that institution made a very significant contribution uh, to expose Nepal's academic institution in Asia, even Europe and United States, uh, American, North America and Western Europe as well. Many Western scholars and Asian scholars used to come to uh, Nepal to you uh, to study at SENAS. And SENAS also studied about South Asia, Southeast Asia and US, China, Russia. And those were the uh, very like you know, specific uh, areas uh, studied by uh, SENAS researchers of TU. And also there was a two major, uh, one of the major like, you know, academic journals uh, produced during those days, strategic studies. And almost 10 years, uh, that strategic series was published and uh, by SENAS. And, you know, uh, SENAS editors went all the way to Islamabad Uh, all the way to Islamabad to interview General Jaul Haq. They went all the way to Delhi to interview Rajiv Gandhi. And most importantly, my guru uh, recently designated ambassador to United States of America, Siddhar Khatri. He faced like even Henry Kissinger. When he, Henry Kissinger came in Kathmandu for two days, so he could manage time to like take to interview Henry Kissinger, like great, like, you know, uh, one of the role model of diplomacy globally. So that's say, strategy series was the pioneer academic contribution in uh, international study and security study in this country. So after 90s, Senas seems like sleeping like shark. And because of some politicization in, within the university, Many uh, like because of leadership, uh, maybe uh, our our political leaders, our university leaders, they could not focus that much how those days like academic and political and even monarch used to focus on foreign policy and international relations those days. So that I'm always proud of like Sinas of those days and which is the very like, you know, uh, significant golden days of IR study in Nepal. So it, was, it has become vacuum almost 20 plus years. And of course there were some research done by students under political science department and journals used to be published, but I think journals are say uh, publishing by political science department was not that much focused uh, after 1990s. So university decided to uh, establish a separate department, separate program, uh, international lesson and diplomacy in 2013. And since 2014 to 2020, I have had opportunity to lead this program at the university. And for last seven years, six best students have passed. What is the strong, uh, like uh, 
strength, what I can say here is that we always select very uh, competent students, 50 competent students for master's program among three, 400 aspirants. It is the interdisciplinary one. And uh, like uh, because of enrollment quality and students quality, and then somehow we try our level best to impart better education for them. So that almost 20 students of first until sixth batch already became foreign service officers and other civil service officers of this country. There are many students graduate became PhD students in many universities across the globe. Some of them are pursuing PhD at the same department. Some of them already became the permanent faculty at the department. Two of them have already became. And many of them has joined the media critic as IR, IR division of Nepali media. And interestingly, some of them are NGO and ILG workers. Interestingly, for the last few months, I have been following some of our graduates have already joined in politics also. Almost six, seven students have become Nepali Congress Mahadevishan for TV. <laughs> because you are, you are not political students. You are really bad. They need undergrad in science so that join the IR. After graduation, they enter into politics. So, so that I think even joining in politics, probably they can, they can be a change maker in their respective political party. So that IR study for last six, seven years, Probably, I can say that contributed quite a lot in bureaucracy, especially foreign service and other like civil service and media, academia, and even politics and NGOs and INGO and UN service as well. So this is what I think uh, IR, uh, we have also like uh, brought out this journal, academic journal in, uh, in the department of IR. And we have also had MOU with the Chinese university, especially try to, connect with us Indian as well. With Chinese university, some 100 students of our department has already got trained in China, uh, Institute of South Eastern Study in China. Some of them are already uh, pursuing PhD in China. So what I'm trying to say is overall is that being a humble academic, uh, I'm trying, we are trying our level best to produce quality, quality bureaucrats, foreign service officers, so through which somehow being a small power landlocked countries having so much problem balancing, rebalancing, counterbalancing, strategic balancing, or even uh, Madan Sar is here. However, there were some Sanskrit graduates used to be a foreign service officer in the past. At least our graduates are really much fluent in speaking in English while dealing with the counterparts. Though we were a uh, very humble rural, like, you know, background schooling, but most of our graduates are really uh, having a communicative, communicative skill and academic excellence. If they will enter into politics, enter into academia, enter into bureaucracy, somehow, Probably, I guess, I believe that will be a great contribution for the foreign policy making implementation of this country from politics, policy makers, bureau, uh, uh, diplomacy, and even in media also, in journalism also. There were so many foreign beat, diplomatic beat journalists in this country, those who don't have any foreign policy and IR background. But now, Many of our graduates are coming up as a media like diplomacy beat contributor. So they will try to change something in favor of the national interest of this country, how we can promote national interests of this country. What is real IR? What is realism? What is non-alignment? What is alignment? What is multi-aligned? Everything they study at school and they have also uh, composed an academic like dissertation back at the school so that on the basis of their mm -hmm. academic background, they can prove their credential in the professionalism so that hopefully our foreign policy, I don't think, I, don't, I cannot blame that our ancestor, really, we had a great diplomats in the past and our, our ancestors like, you know, 
they did have a extraordinary diplomatic skills, even if they didn't go to the like, you know, very uh, old class university in the past. So at least loyalty to the nation, loyalty to the nation is the most important value ethos for every graduates, every bureaucrats, politician and academics that we are trying to teach at our school. So first you should be loyal to the state society of your own own society. Then after you can deal with the others. So that this is what uh, we have been trying our best to produce quality uh, graduates. And those quality graduates have very much like, you know, proven their credential as a, a good placement in the most of them aspire to be a bureaucrats, diplomats. And those upcoming diplomats and bureaucrats of this country will interchangeably contribute for the foreign policy of this country. So that I, I believe uh, in the days to come, uh, I think uh, through this endeavor, unlike uh, advocating, unlike like, you know, being in policy making or diplomatic front, for me, uh, even from right uh, from now on or as well, my uh, my like uh, contribution will be more through educating youngsters to prepare for the competent like diplomacy, diplomat, competent bureaucrats and competent academics and competent journalists or, or politician as well. So that will be my uh, maybe a little very humble contribution. So because of my like, you know, I have uh, I've been assigned a uh, uh, IR study in Nepal so that I can say much about the foreign policy of this country, contemporary issues that already covered by other speakers and probably Madan Sar and some other speakers also will cover uh, foreign policy of Nepal. So I will have, um, I'll be happy to share my perspective, my uh, standpoint uh, on Nepal's foreign policy, contemporary foreign policy strategy of Nepal in another opportunity, maybe this afternoon while, while I will share another session. So uh, having said this, uh, I am really much like, you know, happy to be a one of the, um, one of the like part of this mission to, to make like good uh, quality graduate of for foreign policy and diplomacy of this country. And uh, always uh, will try my level best uh, from very humble, uh, being a humble teacher alone, unlike uh, having like, you know, engaged with all the policy making or, or crafting like, you know, or implementing the foreign policy of this country. So thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Pramodji. I'm, I'm really happy to be here this morning, uh, though I was not that much academic uh, like presenter because my subject was really much kind of like introductory one. Uh, thank you very much once again. And uh, we'll be happy to respond if there will be any questions. Thank you, Dr. Casey. I would like to invite Dr. Nick's speaker, Ambassador Dr. Madan Kumar Bhatrai. Dr. Madan Kumar Hatra is a fo former foreign secretary and Nepalis ambassador to Japan. He was an expert on foreign affairs and diplomacy with the rank equivalent to Minister of State. In his 37 years at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he handled, over, he handled major bilateral visits, serving in India three times for 11 years. Dr. Hatra also was a spokesman of MOFA and the first ever career diplomat to serve as ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany. He holds PhD and DD in international relations from Jadapur University, Kolkata. Dr. Bhatra is also the author of Diplomatic History of Nepal and Parastra Kaprasasar. Thank you. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Bhatra. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila, first of all, because Sheila means foundation. In a country where we believe in foundation laying stones and inaugurations, see, I laid a very good foundation of my uh, career approach. I'm, I'm afraid how far I just deserve for that. Uh, I, just, I also thank uh, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal because it's always a nice thing to attend the nice program on such a nice subject, attend, uh, actually organized by Mr. Nice. Pramod means nice in Sanskrit. So, namaskar and good morning to you distinguished people, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, I am now in a hopeless minority because uh, my colleague Dinesh Vatrai didn't come and our former foreign minister and deputy prime minister also didn't come. And then listening to 
such a wider presentation from such a, such a noted academics. Uh, so please bear with me because I am a humble, uh, to quote the word of uh, Professor Casey, I am a humble non-academic. I take it as a matter of privilege and honor to have the opportunity of attending this particular program. I wish to greet scholars, diplomats, policy makers, senior journalists and experts from Nepal and abroad taking part in this conference and hope that the outcome of such an academic and interactive exercise would go a long way in providing much needed impetus to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other stakeholders in Nepal to make our foreign policy more conducive to our socio-economic transformation, greater cooperation with all friendly countries and goal-oriented. Before I come to my own allotted subject, let me, well, uh, let me uh, say something about Honorable Narayan Kaji Sreshta Prakash, although he's not here right now. Uh, he had a short tenure of duty as Minister for Foreign Affairs. We fondly recall, among others, his emphasis on appointment of professional diplomats for ambassadorial positions to major stations, stress and train and professional career people at the vehicle of a diplomacy and introduction of the code of conduct that is normally observed in bridge rather than, than in practice. Uh, we always remember for him, sir. Oh, I'm rather pleased to note that the organizers have chosen an area of considerable interest to me, Zardia and Nepal's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as I generally belong to the past, not present or future, as I have strong belief in Sir Winston Churchill's observation that we should read history as it contains all the secrets of statecraft. Nepal's foreign office has a very interesting journey in the sense that it's the oldest foreign office of Asia and one of the oldest in the world. This might also be one of the reasons that everyone in Nepal seems to be complacent and profess his or her expertise and feels that in an area not at all requiring any special knowledge, skill, training, and experience. We are a bit weak and even relaxed as far as keeping up records and archives is concerned. Nepal must have a very powerful foreign office if records of regular diplomatic and other exchanges, including marital links in the periods of Kirat, Lisabi, Malla, and Saha periods are of any guide. However, as far as the recorded history of unbroken status of foreign office is concerned, we have to trace to the days of unification of Nepal by King Prithvinaya and Saha the Great, who first entrusted the country's policies, including foreign affairs, to six families of repute and contributions called Thargar, and gave an institutional framework of Zaisi Kotha the first organized foreign office of the country. It is still a matter of conjecture if the name of the office was made after the Zaisis or astrologers who used to be consulted before taking any momentous decision or step in the field of foreign affairs or after the first head of the office, Bhanu Zaisi, also called Bhanu Joshi, as was the case in the United Kingdom when it was almost synonymous to call FO as foreign office or Fox office after the holder of the post of foreign secretary for the first time, Sir James Fox. Prithvinayan Sah was a stickler for talent, expertise, and professional knowledge, as is amply demonstrated by his retention and even promotion of Dinanath Upadhyaya, who represented Magbanpur in Kolkata before unification. Upadhyaya was Nepal's first roving envoy in the sense that he successfully negotiated territorial disputes with the company with a direct contact with Governor General Warren Hastings. One of his close relatives, Lok Raman Upadhyay, who was Nepal's vocal to Calcutta later on, however, felt insecure when he was recalled by Prime Minister Zangabadur to take up some important position at home. Upadhyay went to Karnol in Bihar and settled there. Zaisi Kotha negotiated at least two major treaties with India and the East India Company. The Treaty of Commerce of March 1st, 1792, and Treaty of October 26, 1801, that established for the first time the British mission in Nepal. Captain William Douglas Hunter Knox served as the first vakil in Nepal from April 1802 to March 1803. With the advent of Prime Minister General Vimsen Thapa, the Foreign Office metamorphosed into Munshi Khana, as he thought it prudent to enlist the support of Munshi Pradhans, some of whom were already serving Jaisi Gota. Munshis were trained in foreign office, foreign policy, and several other international issues, including language, as Persian used to be the most dominant language for diplomatic exchange in the region that time. 
A separate college in the name of Majlishkar was in existence for a long time in Nepal that held classes in Persian language with the recruitment of Persian experts from India. It is sad that not only was the college closed after 1950s, the monumental building, quite a historical monumental building located on the site of Nepal's oldest institution of learning, Darawar High School, was recently demolished to make room for tennis court when the school building damaged during the mega earthquake of April 25, 2015 was reconstructed. After the establishment of Munishikhana to replace Jaisi Kota, the Jaisi Kota retained its status, but simply as one of the branches of Munishikhana to deal with domestic side like Mustang and China and Tibet that had uh, an anomal anomalous status that time. In keeping with the tradition in many other countries, the, including the United States Department of State, the Munishikhana also retained the authority of the Office of Mint for some time. That was also the case with the United States State Department. Sahaj and Rana's are particular in Allah. Seems we got disconnected. Just two minutes. Um, I think our speaker has got disconnected. Um, please bear with us. We'll try to reconnect with him. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Please continue. I'm, I'm very sorry. You see, the, there was... The line was snapped, so it has been restored now. I'm very sorry because this is the this is the time we have to follow what to do. So uh, let me resume it. Sahan Rana's were particularly allotting the portfolio of foreign affairs to more talented and enlightened members of their family, circles in bureaucrats and others. When there was abuse, virtual transfer of sovereign rights from King Rajendra to Junior Queen. Rajya Lashmi Devi, in the form of four-point memorandum of January 6, 1843, at least two, three and four related to foreign affairs, including rights to make peace and even declare war. Same was the case when changes of prime ministers took place, specifying the portfolio of foreign affairs. Munshi Khanna changes location several times, like Hanuman Dwaka, Mohan Chok, Bagdarbar, Thapathali Manmandir, Tangal, Kisapohari, and Dokatol. We were settling at Tundikhel at the current location of the late of the later of the, uh, location that later became the headquarters of Nepal Army. Judah Samsir, one of the four strong prime ministers in the Rana area, like Dangabadur, Bir Samsir, and Sandra Samsir, was instrumental in getting the English name of Munsi Khana as Department of Foreign Affairs. Out of six other Ranas holding the post, only Ranodip Singh. Had some, some decent tenure. After the political change in 1951, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs came into being. And after some years, the office of the Chief of Protocol, that was the successor to Munsi Captain Office, was merged with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So, under some reason, I reorganized the Munsi Hana from the status of with two wings, Britain India Division and Munsi Captain Office. Munsi Hana was known for a very long tenure of years, 
While six or seven munshis served for a period of 168 years, three great, we can compare it to the American system also, the great civil servants of the State Department also did the same. William Hunter Jr., Alvey Augustus A.D. and Wilbur John Carr served a period of 116 years with some overlaps covering the administration of 26 presidents from Andrew Jackson to Franklin Roosevelt. In terms of location, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the post-1951 era also oscillated from different places. Like it was in Singadarwar, then it went to city and national city hall, then it came back to Singadarwar, the new building, then it was shifted to Sital Nevas, then to Naraniti Palace, where I served as a foreign secretary for some time, and finally to Singadarwar, where I retired as foreign secretary for 24 days. While the office has a glorious history, at least two things were visible in the work of the ministry in earlier days. The first was the selection of generally the best and talented person available among politicians or bureaucrats as foreign minister. The second was the special treatment the ministry enjoyed in the administration. All these things seem to have been ignored in recent years, and the status of foreign ministry has been relegated to the status of a glorified post office rather than a self-sustaining organization with pressures from different organizations. And the anomaly that our prime minister probably tended to blindly follow Jawaharlal Nehru and Sawan Lai, both coming from completely different backgrounds, but endowed with at least three similarities. Their hard work, profound knowledge and leadership of the area, arena of foreign affairs, their good knowledge of Europe and contemporary history of the world, and the charismatic personality. As both the leaders assumed the role of foreign minister for a long time, Nehru for the whole period of his premiership, and Chao for almost a decade after the establishment of the People's Republic, we simply, we probably simply imitated, imitated them, possibly thinking that it was the privilege of the Prime Minister. Some comparison to neighboring countries may be in order. China didn't have a unified foreign office until the establishment of Sungli Yemen in 1861. The organization lasted for only 40 years until replaced by the Provisional Article 12 and the Boxer Protocol of 1901. The provision led to the establishment of Waiwupu at the Foreign Office, imposed by the external powers. The organization lasted for only 12 years. The succeeding office, Waichaupu, has three incarnations in the sense that it continued its office in Beijing from 1912 to 1928, and from 1928 to 1949 in Nanjing, and from 1949 onwards, from Beijing after the, the declaration of the People's Republic. India had the Ministry of External Affairs since March 1949. After change of nomenclature from the Ministry of External Affairs and Commonwealth Relations, constituted with the dawn of independence in 1947, this India company had taken the lead to establish its own foreign office in India in 1784, barely within two years of the establishment of foreign office in England in 1782. This was done with the amalgamation of northern and southern departments that had existed between 1689 to 1782 and bifurcation of the office into home and foreign offices. The company's office was called Secret and Political Department from 1784 to 1942. When it was 1842, when it started to be called Foreign Department with three branches, Foreign Political and Domestic. After 1914, it was called Foreign and Political Department there was a bifurcated international affairs department and political department after 1935. In 1945, the Department of Indian Overseas was called Commonwealth Relations Department. In 1946, the two departments, external affairs department and Commonwealth Relations Department were merged to become the Department of External Affairs and Commonwealth Relations. So in view of all this short comparison, I feel that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has a wonderful journey. So thank you very much for your kind patience and just taking a little bit more time, and I'm sorry for the interruption. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bhattrai. I would like to invite our next speaker, Deepak Raj Joshi. Deepak Raj Joshi served as the Chief Executive Officer of Nepal Tourism Board, National Tourism Organization of Nepal. During his 20 years of work experience in destination management, tourism promotion and public-private partnership, Joseph successfully led the Tourism Recovery Committee, TRC, 
Nepal Secretariat in coordination with the private and public sector. Josie has been awarded with the highest IIPT Champions in Challenge Award 2018 from International Institute for Peace Through Travel and Tourism at the ITCMS International Travel Crisis Management Summit in London, UK. He was also awarded as the best CEO in Asia and the National Tourism Board category. Mr. Josie has written extensively on tourism for selected issues of national broadsheets broad and contributed to book readings in rural tourism. He holds a master's degree in social science as well as in business administration MBA from the Tribune University, Kathmandu, Nepal. The floor is yours, Mr. Josie. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Silaji. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pramod, for organizing a really nice program uh, called Nice Nepal. Uh, so good to see all the scholars and, and um, the special personalities who have um, gained so much of excellence in their career in this sector. Uh, first of all, I would like to also extend a special thanks to uh, Nice Nepal and the team of Nice Nepal for incorporating tourism sector in this uh, uh, talk, uh, in, in this uh, very important talk program, Understanding Nepal's Foreign Policy. Uh, I will be talking about a little bit about the importance of tourism, which I think I need not to uh, talk much about it because we all know how important tourism is for uh, to drive our socioeconomic prosperity. And a little bit, I will, uh, I will also um, highlight about the impact of COVID in our tourism and how we can recover our tourism faster. Um, basically, uh, to talk about uh, our tourism, we all know Nepal is not a new uh, destination uh, in terms of global tourism. Uh, we have also experience of tourism handling, uh, experience of 60 to 70 years in handling of tourism. Uh, <clears throat> But despite having so much of potential, uh, it is also uh, a bitter truth that we could not unleash the potential that we have because of so many reasons. Uh, and just to talk about uh, uh, the potential of tourism, uh, there, is a, there is a new trend, a global shift in, in tourism also, not only in Nepal, around the world. Uh, until 20 years back, tourism used to be uh, called as a, as, as a leisure activity, an activity of, uh, for a hand, handful of allies in the world, limited in the few destinations only, limited in the few countries only. But now tourism is expanding everywhere. Every countries and communities, they are trying to highlight themselves as a, uh, as, as a, as a pristine and the premier holiday destination. So there is a kind of threat also. Uh, <clears throat> So, but, but now, since last uh, 10 to 15 years, tourism is turning as an as a, as a experiential economy. Uh, people are looking for new experiences in tourism. So in that line, I think destinations like Nepal has greater potential now. Uh, 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 when, when, when we talk about tourism uh, products or, or destinations, um, since people are looking for variety of experiences in a single destination, Nepal has so much to offer. Uh, for example, probably Nepal is the most diverse country on earth. Our lowest point from the sea level is 60 meter and highest is 88, and it is just in between the distance of around 150 kilometer. So, so we can, um, even we, Nepalese, when we travel uh, different parts of Nepal, when we cross Every 10, 10 to 15 to 20 kilometer, we, we get a chance to explore new faces, new climate, new landscape, so many experiences that Nepal offers. And that's the major experience that the global tourists, they are looking for these days. Uh, not only that, uh, uh, recently, uh, there have been a, 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 a huge interest in, in two segments of tourism. The one is adventure segment, another is a spiritual segment of tourism. And in both the segments, Nepal has 
much more potential uh, in comparison to other uh, destinations. While talking about the brand, I think <clears throat> maybe in other socioeconomic sectors, Nepal's image might be a little bit weaker, but in, in tourism, Nepal's image is very, very strong. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for example, the name Everest, everyone knows in the world. The name Gokha, everybody knows. The, the name Lumini or Buddha, everybody knows. Kathmandu, Pokhara, these are the names the world knows better. So, so it is, it is uh, when talking about the tourism as a brand, also there is a strong uh, positioning so far that we have. Um, uh, in, in product side, obviously we have so much of strength uh, in terms of tourism. And then regarding the market side also, uh, Nepal is being positioned in, in a better place now. We are in between of the half of the world uh, economy and the population which is uh, uh, emerging as a, as a uh, economic uh, power centers. Uh, uh, more than, I think uh, more than 20 cities which has a population of 20 million uh, plus uh, population can be accessed uh, uh, in, in one to two and a half hours of uh, flight uh, distance. That is also another potential that, that uh, we have in tourism. But the only thing that we could not uh, unleash the potential that we have is because of our limited infrastructure and the limited uh, uh, connectivity that we have. And since our, our new uh, two airports are coming up, uh, maybe that can add uh, significantly uh, a good value in our tourism. The only airport that we have so far in Kathmandu is also expanding. So that can also uh, add some value in, uh, in, the, in, in that uh, line, the, bottom, the, the hindering uh, factor that we are facing so far. So in that line, uh, we, have, we have greater potential, uh, obviously in tourism. Um, I, I was going through some, some, uh, uh, some, some facts, like you know, the, in 2010, to 2020, uh, Nepal's economy largely uh, was uh, contributed by remittance economy. But if tourism is given a better priority, if tourism is handled well, I think the decade of uh, 2020 to 2030 uh, is, uh, could be a decade of, uh, 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 of, of um, uh, 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 economic uh, contribution made by the tourism sector. I think tourism sector can really drive Nepal's socio-economic prosperity uh, uh, very soon. Not only that, uh, while talking about the, in, in some uh, facts, for example, uh, uh, in, in employment sector also, Nepal uh, uh, is creating uh, employment for about uh, 1 million uh, Nepalese, uh, uh, Nepalese people directly and indirectly. Uh, in, in GDP also, as per WTTC, World Travel and Tourism Council, it is contributing nearly uh, 7 to 8% contribution in our GDP. In foreign exchange earning, this is second largest contributor as a single sector. Uh, in bringing foreign investment also, uh, it is one of the largest foreign investment bringing sector. Uh, so, so it has a uh, uh, very good potential in, in terms of tourism. Not only that, uh, since we have already signed so many MOUs, uh, so many understandings with international communities regarding the environment friendly businesses or the sustainable model of uh, uh, business development. And I think tourism has a key role to play uh, in, that, in that line also. Uh, tourism, we all know that tourism is a very, very environment friendly business. Tourism, uh, while, while talking about the comparing with other uh, economic sectors, for example, most of the times the manufacturing industries or chemical industries or other type of industries, sometimes they try to dislocate local communities. But the beauty of tourism is it always interlinks communities. There are so many good examples in Nepal also. It, creates a very good impact for conservation of our heritage, culture, nature, wildlife. So in that line also tourism has better role. Uh, tourism has played a better role uh, in, uh, in this line also. So these are the, some good things about tourism. 
We all know that uh, tourism is going through a very, very difficult time, especially after this, uh, after the uh, spread of uh, COVID-19. Uh, the private sector, the government uh, uh, institutions and key stakeholders, they all are trying to design and implement a series of measures to reduce the risk and control the spread of the virus. Um, since tourism is the business which is based on the movement of the people, uh, and, and these, uh, this coronavirus uh, created a negative impact in, 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 in the movement of the people. It has severely hit uh, the tourism industry. Uh, uh, while talking about the uh, few data about uh, 2019 only, uh, we, we had received nearly 1.2 million visitors, uh, international uh, visitors from different countries. And this, this number uh, excludes the number who visit, I mean, the Indian visitors who visit by land. That number is another 1.4 million. And uh, we had announced a Visit Nepal campaign uh, targeting to double the number of arrival. So uh, it has created really a very, very negative impact in our tourism uh, in, in 2020 and in 2021 also. Uh, we received nearly, we are receiving nearly 200,000 visitors only, which is, uh, 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 which is decrease of nearly 81% in uh, arrival. So in that line, it is uh, creating negative impact in our tourism. And to bounce back our tourism faster and better, I think we have to uh, adopt a very clear cut strategy uh, probably I think our government is uh, trying to adopt some strategy uh, to, to allocate by allocating some months as a survival, year of survival, year of revival 2020 could be, year of survival 2023 could be. <clears throat> uh, one good thing about tourism is uh, as it is changing in its trend, I think uh, a few years back tourism was confined to uh, its core sector only. Uh, for example, it was, uh, it was, it was, it used to be the uh, affairs of, for example, hotels, tour operators, airlines, travel agents, and the Ministry of Tourism only. But now it has become a, a very important uh, activity of cross sectors also, for example, uh, heritage sites, museums, cultural segments, national parks, uh, immigration, so many other uh, sectors and factors also. So uh, uh, this, is, this is one thing that uh, tourism is uh, uh, expanding, especially, especially after this pandemic uh, in, in, in global platforms, tourism is being surveyed as uh, what kind of destinations people will be choosing immediately after COVID. And most of the uh, surveys they have shown that uh, most of the visitors, they will prefer uh, to the destinations which are nature-based destinations, which are, which, uh, in, uh, which are isolation-based uh, isolation activities and which sites or the countries are less crowded destinations. So in that line also, uh, we have, we have uh, uh, better days ahead if we handle, if we really handle well uh, our, our tourism because our, most of the destinations are in nature-based destinations, for example, be it national parks or trekking trails or other destinations as well. Um, most of the activities that we do in Nepal are also isolation-based activities, for example, trekking itself, so many adventure activities, wildlife activities. These activities are also isolation-based activities. Uh, and Nepal never was a mass uh, destination. Our largest group used to be 50 to 60 or maximum 100 packs um, in, in a single group. Whereas in other destinations, the, they, they are receiving more than 2,000, 5,000 groups uh, um, in, in, in a single package. So in that line also, we have uh, a better timing now. I think, and, and this is the right time uh, to position Nepal as the world's one of the most pure, pristine, uh, happy and healing destination. And, and, and we have to gear up to unleash the potential that we have uh, in Nepal. 
uh, and, and by inspiring the private sector who develop, promote, and sell extraordinary exp experiential tourism products, we can do this. Uh, we also need to involve engaging with multi-sectoral industries and the Department of Government of Nepal uh, so that we can bring high value uh, uh, visitors, especially after pandemic, uh, because most of the visitors, they will be looking for uh, very, very unique experiences, as I mentioned earlier, nature-based destinations. So we can, we can uh, I think, obviously, uh, in, in 2020 and 2021, uh, the COVID has created so much of negative impacts in our tourism. But 2023 and 2024 and 2022 can be a, 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 a very good year for our tourism, better than 2019. Because yes, there are limited uh, visitors who are who are traveling abroad the, uh, around the world, but there are very limited destinations uh, which are opened up, which are ready to welcome visitors. So, so, so I think, especially after pandemic, our days are better. Uh, but we need to focus and give some priority so that we can we can we can bring a better number of visitors. Uh, <clears throat> Especially after the crisis, there are four segments uh, which uh, are key, se key segments uh, 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 which helps us to bounce back better and faster. And these segments are obviously the first one is uh, uh, the domestic segment, uh, which is already uh, uh, rebound quickly. And second is uh, the niche segment in which the travelers has a strong motivation and a strong attachment to the destinations. And there are so many visitors which are uh, willing to come to Nepal. Uh, and, and third is the business and the corporate segment in which a kind of compulsion is there uh, to restart and widen and explore new opportunities in business segments. And third and fourth is the pilgrimage segment. So we, we, we need to prioritize these four segments while we are going into uh, revive our tourism. Uh, uh, two months back, we have already announced uh, 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 no mandatory quarantine uh, uh, policy for the fully vaccinated visitors. Uh, and one good thing about Nepal's tourism is probably Nepal is one of the few countries which has given priority for the, to the tourism sector uh, in, in the vaccination drive. Um, uh, most of the tourism fraternity, I mean the frontline tourism workers, they are already vaccinated. Not only the tourism frontliners or the service providers, but the uh, uh, the communities also who are in um, iconic destinations, for example, in Everest region, in Manang, in Mustang area, Annapurna region, they all are vaccinated. But the uh, thing is, we need to communicate uh, 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 these things uh, rapidly. Uh, we have also proposed, we have been practicing, but we have not uh, announced or developed as a, as, as a model. So I would also like to propose a V2V model of uh, restarting our tourism. Uh, uh, I mean, the vaccinated guest receiving service from the vaccinated host. So that, can, that model can really, uh, 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 can be a good model to restart tourism in not only in Nepal, but for many other destinations also. In that line also, uh, we, can, we can really work well. So in longer term, we have uh, better days ahead. Uh, uh, the only thing is we need to prioritize uh, one thing in uh, the development of the infrastructure, the level of basic infrastructure that uh, is hindering our tourism uh, uh, to develop. And second thing is uh, we have to network well uh, as I mentioned, uh, it is largely dependent on the cross-sector now. So diplomacy has a greater role to play. Uh, uh, these days, in diplomacy also, we are talking about the second track, third track of diplomacy, uh, soft, up, soft power of diplomacy, nation branding, and tourism is one of the powerful tools uh, to position Nepal uh, for the better image. Uh, and, and tourism really uh, can play a better role uh, as a, as a uh, uh, <clears throat> strengthening the diplomatic ties with different countries. Uh, one good thing about Nepal is I think we all have experienced well whenever we travel across the world and when we introduce ourselves as a 
uh, Nepali, uh, and we get simply and largely two comments mainly. Uh, one is beautiful Nepal. Second is the people are so friendly. People are so hospitable. These two comments are very, very strong brand for uh, tourism. And, and this is, I think, a uh, better thing for our diplomacy also, better image. Uh, so these are the few uh, things I would like to share here. Uh, tourism cannot be developed in isolation. Uh, <clears throat> uh, when everything are better and when every uh, sector is supporting tourism, tourism creates better yield uh, for many other sectors too. So let's come together, together for tourism and being together for tourism, we can really create better impact for our uh, nation building, nation branding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Josie. Ladies and gentlemen, here we come to the end of the inaugural session. To propose a vote of thanks, I would like to invite Sunyana Karki, Research Associate NICE. You may please proceed. Thank you, Sheila. Shall I start? Okay. Uh, distinguished scholars, experts, excellencies, former diplomats, friends from the diplomatic community, ladies and gentlemen, namaste and good morning. As we come to the end of the session, I take a great honor in proposing a vote of thanks on behalf of NICE to all who have graced us with their presence and contributed their parts to make this inaugural session a resounding success. We would like to express our profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to all our panelists, Professor Dr. Meena Vaidar Malla, Professor Samuram Samkhada, Professor Dr. Kharga Kesi, Ambassador Dr. Madan Patrai, and Dr. Deepak R. Josi for being part of the session and delivering such a comprehensive and uh, convincing presentation. We would also like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Uh, finally, I must also also mention our deep sense of appreciation for our audience members, several other distinguished uh, speakers who will also be joining us in our upcoming sessions, and those who are watching us live on our Facebook. Thank you for your valuable time and attention. This is the very first session of the event, and we have many such sessions lined up for today and tomorrow, so we hope you join us in our next session as well. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all uh, with us this morning and hope to stay connected with you in the future as well. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sunina Karki. Now we would like to prepare for our next session. Thank you for being with us throughout the inauguration. We would like we would be happy to see you in the upcoming sessions. Thank you. <laughs>